So although not recognized as an official medical condition, affluenza has been acknowledged by an increasing number of cultural commentators as a malaise which affects wealthy young people. The word affluenza is a portmanteau of two words, of the word affluence and also of the word influenza. So it's wealth and it's sickness. And the most infamous example of affluenza was the case of Ethan Anthony Couch, who at the age of 16 was involved in a horrific car crash while he was under the influence and four lives were lost because of him. When his lawyers took, them, uh, took the case to court and they argued before the judge, his lawyer in a telling statement said that Ethan Anthony Couch was not actually morally malicious, but merely had affluenza. And so when all of the statements were made and the judge gave a judgment, the public was incredulous and mortified that Ethan Anthony Couch was not given a long prison sentence, but instead was given community service and some fines. People could not understand how this young man could have made a decision that was so mortal, but have been given such a light sentence. After all, we expect the nature of a consequence to fit the severity of an action. So if you're caught speeding by a police officer, you expect to pay the ticket. If you eat a tub of Ben and Jerry's every single day because it's the lockdown and you can't exercise, then you're not surprised when your clothes become a little more snug than they were in March. If you repeatedly deliver gossip that your friends uh, uh, tell you after you have promised confidentiality, then you shouldn't be surprised when the action comes that you are no longer trusted. Our actions, both good and bad, lead to consequences. And when those consequences don't meet the severity of our actions, we start to feel like it's not fair. When we see other people gaming the system, suffering less, benefiting more than their actions deserve, we become upset, and I think some of us, because I felt it, maybe you have to secretly wish you could become jury and judge and administer some justice when it seems like the consequence doesn't fit the action. Today's parable, as we're going through our summer series on the parables of Jesus, is a parable most of us have heard, even if you don't go to church. Even if you used to go to church, you probably heard it when you were young. Today's parable is a parable that Jesus, the story master teller, tells us, an ancient story that has had millions of reprisals in each person's life. Act one of this parable, there is a young man who wants to seek his fortune in life. And so this young man impudently asks his father for his share of the inheritance while his dad is still alive, while his dad is still healthy. He asks for his portion of his inheritance. Now, I'm sure even though the story doesn't tell us that his mother tried to persuade him not to do so, but he didn't listen because he was a rebellious and stubborn son who would broach no deceleration of his inheritance. And so the story goes that with a heavy heart, his father listens to his son, goes and he withdraws money from his 401k. He pays the early withdrawal penalties, gives the money to his son, about 40% of his wealth. And then his son takes the check, which is a six-figure check because his father was doing well. And he jumps on the next plane, goes to New York City to find himself, to live it up a little. And then the story goes on, as Jesus tells us, that he blows all of his months in a few all of his money and a few wild months living la vida loca. Act two, as Jesus tells his story. This young man one day wakes up. He's hungover. He's broke. 
he's friendless. None of his friends return his calls. He sees them leaving him on red, but they never return his text messages. He realizes that perhaps they were only his friends when life was good, when he was doing well, and so they really were not his friends. He barely has enough change to take the bus that morning when he wakes up after declining all of the calls from credit card companies that told him he was late in his payment. And so he goes in his pocket, finds the change he has left, gets on a bus to get to his 5 a.m. shift working at an industrial pig farm where he feeds the pigs. And when he gets there during his early morning shift, he sits with fog coming out of his uh, uh, coming out of his mouth, and he feels the icy fingers of despair slowly coming around his neck. He sees his future, and there isn't much of it. And he watches in the corner as hope, personified, packs its bag and leaves out of the door. And so during this time, and his 15-minute lunch break at this hog farm, looking at the food that the pigs are eating with a gurgling stomach, thinking maybe if I ate it, it would satiate me, he sketches a plan to go back home to his father. And Jesus puts it this way in Luke chapter 15, verse 17, that this young man, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. He says, I will go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. And so you can imagine with me sitting there, it's cold, it's an early morning, he has nothing, and he thinks, what's the worst that could happen? Let me just go home and beg my father to forgive me. And so he pulls out his phone, ready to send an email, not a text message, he has to class it up and be a little more official with his dad. So he's going to send him an email of sincere regret. He begins, dear dad. But halfway through the first sentence, he comes to his senses and has a brilliant idea. Why don't I just go to my father and plead my cause with my big puppy eyes in front of his face? It's harder to say no to his son in person than it would be to respond to an email. And so in a moment of calculated risk, he goes, he borrows some money, he gets on a bus and he starts to go back home. Now, the audience listening to Jesus' story is waiting for Act 3 because they know how Act 3 should go. They know the reception that awaits young scions affected by affluenza. They know what's going to happen when he gets back to the city gates, even before he makes it back to his dad's house. And so they're waiting. They're just rubbing their hands, waiting for Jesus to deliver Act 3 when he gets his comeuppance. When the action becomes concomitant with what he did they wait, and then Jesus continues. But before he continues, a Pharisee, I imagine in the crowd who is listening, starts to recite under his breath what is going to happen to this young man. They know what is going to happen, so he starts to recite what is going to happen. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city, to the gate of his city. And then they shall say to the elders of his city, this son of yours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voices. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you and all Israel shall hear and fear. So this is what the crowd is waiting for Jesus to tell them. This is how the story should end. He's rebellious. He's stubborn. He's a glutton. He's a drunkard. 
He's blown all his dad's money, and now he's going to come back the temerity of him. So they wait for the end of this story. But instead of Jesus Christ going to Deuteronomy 21, he informs his incredulous audience that the following occurred when this young, stubborn, rebellious man comes home. Luke 15, verse 20. And it says, this young man, he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The young man's father runs to him and embraces him and kisses him before the vigilantes at the gate start to pick up their rocks, start to smooth off their boulders that they're going to use to stone this young man. Jesus tells us that the father gets to the young man. He ignores his son's prepared speech of contrition. He sends a group text message to the entire family, and he throws a huge party. And at the party, the father gives his son his checkbook, and everyone watches aghast. He gives him his checkbook. He goes back in front of the family business, and he writes his name back on the banner letting them know that he is back and he is included without any remorse. Verse 24 tells us in Luke chapter 15 that the father, weeping with joy, says this, For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now, you've heard this story before, and I'm sure many of you will be able to Uh, fit in to either the younger son or to the older brother. Often many of us who would see ourselves as the older brother are those who have stayed in church, done the right thing, those who have uh, done what society expected of us. And so we tend to um, understand how the young man's older brother responds because the story tells us that he is livid. He is apoplectic. He blows a fuse at his father and refuses to attend the party. And it's interesting because when we read the story, often we pit the younger brother against the older brother, but they are both at fault. They are both at fault in how they are treating the father. The younger brother was trying to get control of his life by leaving the father and disobeying. And yet the older brother was trying to control his father by staying and obeying. So Jesus gives us this story filled with levels that speaks to us who have stayed in the church our whole life and speaks to those who have gone out and lived a life that has had horrible consequences, wondering if God will take them back. He says all of us are at fault. If we try to leave him, because we want to do our own thing, because we don't want anyone to tell us how to live our life, then we find ourselves in a painful situation. If we stay so that through our good behavior, we can control how he is toward us, then we also are trying to control him. They're both lost, they're both alienated from the Father, and they're both saying, I would like your things, but I don't want you. Now, a couple of weeks ago now, I'm scrolling through Instagram, I get a DM, and I read the message. A young man has sent me a message, and at first I'm not sure who it is, and then I realized that this was someone I had known in another lifetime in a different capacity. And he shares his story with me. It's the prodigal story. He's gone through Adventist education. His parents are Christians. And yet, after finishing uh, going to one of our academies, he has gone back to Seattle and he's now living a life that, according to his own words, had put him in a dark place. He was making decisions that were hurting his body and his soul. And he was wondering in that message he sent me, had I gone too far? Is it too late? Is God going to ever take me back? It was the prodigal story, and all of us know the prodigal story. We have been the prodigal. We have aunts and uncles who have been the prodigal. We have cousins that, although they are the prodigal right now, they get castigated by our family members. Far from God. 
and the details don't even matter because this is a story that repeats over and over again. And he asked me this question, would God take me back? So I responded. I told him that the foundational gospel message that we find in the Bible, the good news of Jesus, is the same one that Christ was pursuing in the parable of the prodigal son. And it's this, I told him, our behavior, our behavior does not determine God's love for us. Our behavior does not determine God's love for us. In fact, we do not need to convince or remind God of something that he has never forgotten or denied, namely that we are his sons and daughters, his children. Because in the question, he was saying, I'm so far from God. I'm so alienated from God. Do the promises of God apply to me? Am I still his child? And the story of the prodigal son tells us that we don't need to convince God of something he has neither forgotten nor denied, that you are his child, regardless of your behavior. And I can imagine that there may be some of you who are listening and who, who may be thinking, well, that doesn't sound right. How about doing good stuff? That's moralism would say if you do good, then you can be loved. The gospel says that God loves us and we are his children regardless of our behavior. It's not behavior or merit or standing or wealth or morality or affiliation or race or gender that determines God's response to us as his children. Okay, Andreas, you're getting worked up. What is it then? What is it that determines how God feels about us and whether God loves us? Let's find out together. Because at the beginning of the parable, Jesus introduces the young man by saying a certain man had two sons. He doesn't say a certain man had two young adult male children. He doesn't say a certain man had two young adult male children who looked like him. He says a certain man had what? Two sons, not two adult male who attend synagogue every Sabbath dutifully. No, he had two sons. And although this son starts to indulge in behavior that is wrong and that is actually harmful to himself, because that's the thing about sin, it's self-defeating and it's us going against the grain of the universe and we hurt ourselves. Although he engages in harmful behavior, he is still a son. And so at the beginning of the story, when he is in the father's house, is he a son or is he a sinner? He's a son when he's in the father's house. Okay, so when he becomes impudent in his request and he says, give me my money, and he goes out, blows all of it on wild living and prostitutes, and by the way, this is a smaller side, it's the older brother who says that his younger brother blew the money on prostitutes. I'm always scratching my head like, bro, how did you know? Were you there? Is that what you would have done if you took off your fake mask pretending that you're holy in the father's house? That's neither the point. But he says, oh, he blew his money on drinking, on gambling, and on prostitutes. Was he still a son? Yes. When he found himself feeding pigs, broke creditors after him, was he still a son? Yes. When he was walking back to his village, avoiding the thoroughfares, using all the back routes so that no one would see him covering his face with a cap real low, was he still a son? Yes. When he came and he saw his father running toward him, wondering if his, if his father was about to MMA and clock him, was he still a son? Yes. When he was in the party and his father was weeping, tears of joy that his son who was lost and he thought was dead was back, was he a son then? Yes, he was. He was never not the son of the father. 
regardless of his behavior, it did not change his relationship. He was always the son. He was always the child. And Jesus in this parable challenges the long-held assumption of the ancient crowd and, I think, the tacit belief held by people with modern sensibilities that our outward behavior, excuse me, yeah, that our outward behavior can change our inner identity. And this is crucial. This is the gospel. Because Jesus says your outward behavior does not change your inner identity as a child of God. The New Testament declares that our grounding identity, the truest thing about us, when you wake up, it's not anything else than this, that you are a child of God. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 1, 3 to 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. Verse 5, he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. Galatians 3.26, for in Christ Jesus you are children of God through faith. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. That's John 1 verse 12. And then 1 John 3 verse 1, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. And Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so today, I'm hoping that young man who sent me a message on Instagram, I told him, watch the service at 11. I'm hoping you're watching. I'm hoping all the other prodigals are watching. And you are hearing through my voice a declaration that Jesus Christ gave to us in this book about who you are. And you are hearing these verses in accordance with the witness of Scripture to know your grounding identity, the truest thing about you today, regardless of what you did last night, regardless of what you were up to last week, regardless of the mistakes you have made, regardless of how much you have been written off, the truest thing about you, your grounding identity, according to God, is that you are His child. When my daughter, who's now seven, was a baby, you know, it's always a strange thing. You go to the hospital, you have a child, and then after a few days, depending on how long you're there, they discharge you. And then you have a baby, and you're like, wait, what? They're like, yeah, bye, go home. And you have no idea what you're supposed to do. You figure it out. All they do is eat, sleep, and poop. That's it. And so you figure out how to make sure that they can sleep well. You give them food when they're hungry. You change them when they poop. And when my daughter was doing that, I loved her. She was mine, and all she did was eat, sleep, and poop. And my friends asked any parent, although she couldn't read, although she couldn't walk, although she couldn't perform, and she didn't produce anything to add to the economy, she was my daughter, and I loved her. She is mine, and that is enough. Now, did I hope that when she grew up, she might learn how to ride a bike? Of course. Did I hope she'd learn how to read one day? Yes. Maybe how to make music on an instrument? Of course. We have wishes and dreams for our children. We aspire for them to become the best of who they are. Our heart breaks when they don't reach it. But does it change the fact they are our children? Never. And so often in our lives, we have been duped by a false moralistic gospel that says God only loves you and claims you when you behave in the right way. And Jesus explodes this myth in this parable. He says, put away your internal measuring stick. God is not measuring you. He is proudly claiming you as his child. And if you realize that God is coming for you when you are running away from him. He is waiting with open arms. I hope for somebody today that is 
good news. And that will give you the breathing room to stop what you are doing and to turn back and to recognize God has never changed how he sees you or how much he loves you. Truly, it's never changed. The story of the prodigal son insists that whenever you try to get control of your life by going away from God, you end up controlling you end up giving control of your life to other things. So I do want to give some counterbalance to those who may be thinking, well, in that case then, people can live a crazy old life and God still loves them. No, remember I said that sin is self-defeating and when we sin, we go against the grain of the universe and we hurt ourselves. So there are consequences, but it doesn't change how much God loves us. Henry Nouwen in his book, The Return of the Prodigal Son, explains this. He says, and this is a long quote, but stay with me as we read this quote and we end. He says, home is the center of being where I can hear the voice that says, you are my beloved in whom I am well pleased. And I'm going to just read this for you. This is Henry Nouwen. He says, home is where we are. And he goes, Jesus made it clear that the same voice he heard in the Jordan River and on Mount Tabor can be heard by me. He makes it clear that there is home with the Father. But if I decide to keep control, if I go into the world, I will keep running around asking everything, do you really love me? Do you really love me? And this is so haunting. Because he's saying of all of those people who are prodigals, and perhaps you don't see yourself as a prodigal, you see yourself expressing your freedom and your liberty, that what you are doing in leaving God is really searching for home. And when you search for home outside of God, you go to people, you go to things, you go to careers, you go to people's opinions, and you say, am I loved? Am I good enough? Am I worth it? And he says... And uh, now in continues, I give all the power to the voices of of the world. It is the world that defines me then. The world's love is full of ifs. Yes, I love you if you're good looking, if you're intelligent, if you're well off, if you're educated, if you have connections, if you're productive. Endless ifs. And it's not too hard to know when I have left home spiritually. Resentment, jealousy, Desire for revenge, lust, greed, ambition, rivalry are all obvious signs that I have left home, that I am letting the world define me with its love full of ifs. But when I am home with the Father, then I know I am the beloved. I can confront and console and admonish and encourage without any fear of rejection or need for affirmation. I can suffer persecution without the need for revenge or receive praise without using it as proof of my goodness. So my friends, in these last few moments, and and the air conditioning is on in the church. You'll see me sweat here. (laughs) This is sweat of conviction because it's such a base message that all of us need to hear. It's such a fundamental message of the gospel that can never be reiterated enough. And I am hoping that young man is watching. And I'm hoping there are many young men and women and others who are watching. I'm hoping there are people who perhaps felt bruised by religion or felt that the church was full of hypocrites who left the church and also left God who may realize that God is not judging you Based on your behavior, he always sees you as a child. Yes, he wants you to rise. Yes, he wants you to live a more beautiful life. But like this father, God has a soft heart and hard feet. Because whenever he sees you turn toward him, he starts to run. He starts to kick up dust. He lifts up the skirt of his robe and he runs for every single prodigal who is trying to figure out the right words to come back to him. He says, I don't need the speech. I don't need the prepared talk. I don't need you to pretend that you are really sorry. I love you. And God has hard feet and a soft heart. And my prayer is that for all of us, as a community of people, we will be beacons of light pointing people to Jesus when they come back for their prodigal life. 
that we will be not gatekeepers but gate openers for people to come back into community with God. That like Jesus, like that father in the story, we can be a community who have soft hearts and hard feet.